Okay, welcome to uh, the elite program the, uh, of the Master of Engineering degree at the University of Toronto. Uh, in this short video, I'm going to put the courses that I teach into perspective because I now teach six master's courses as part of the elite program, or five, five as part of the elite and one specialty on aerospace. And uh, overall, I've taught nine courses at the U of T, and I want to put them all in perspective, particularly the six core master's courses. I want so that students know what the emphasis on each of the courses is. So it's my portfolio of courses as part of the Master of Engineering program at the U of T. And the, these are the courses. Uh, APS 1012 was my very first course ever uh, in managing business innovation and transformational change. APS 1013 was the next course, which was basically called Applying Innovation, where we work with industry. So all those students have projects working with industry partners in a, in a variety of industries. And then the next one was uh, APS 1028, which is Operations and Production Management. So APS 102 focuses on change, and, and, and 1028 focuses on how do you manage sustaining operations. So how do you manage the design and building of an aircraft, for example, process, or how do you manage the operations of a hospital, or of a bank, or of an office, or of a consulting engineering firm, or a management consulting firm, or of a law firm. So it focuses, but it's very heavily manufacturing oriented. This one, AER 1601, is engineering and operations management precisely, specifically for the aerospace industry. And I, at the time of speaking, I've partnered with Bombardier Aerospace in Toronto to put uh, teams, typically four teams of about six students, five to six students in there to actually solve operational problems and solve issues. So it's, it's, it's similar to the applying course, but it is very much focused on aerospace. So it's vertically, verti vertical education in an industry sector. And then this course, APS 1018, was actually the third course I taught, and it's the history and philosophy of engineering and really what it's doing. It's bringing the moral and ethical dimensions to the whole practice of engineering. So for example, uh, you know, when you're in your 50s or 60s, you don't want to wake up after working for a company or in an industry for 30, 35 years and say, hey, what, what was I involved with that for? They, they caused so much damage to the world. Uh, though I don't make judgments, I don't say this industry is moral or immoral, I don't do that, but I, what I do do is get you to think of what the end result is. Plus, it's a bit of the role of the engineer in society. So let's just look here. Now, all my courses are built on my practical experience. So the Master of Engineering is a career-oriented professional degree. So it's for those that are working in industry or desire to work in industry. So if you're doing a PhD research and you desire to perhaps go into management consulting, which I never mentioned, APS 1049 is management consulting for engineers and applied scientists. So in some ways, it wraps up all of these courses into a, 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 a true career direction for those that want to go into consulting at a very senior level, like eventually a C-level consultant where you're dealing with chief executives or chief operating officers or senior vice presidents and so on. Of course, you can also, these, these equally apply to those that take a career in industry as vice presidents of operations, of engineering, of manufacturing, of, of finance, whatever it happens to be, they, they are, or CEOs, they, they apply to that path as well. So the industry management path or the consulting management path. All my courses are based on these companies. I'm not going to go through them all, but there's a lot of aerospace companies. Some of them I was an employee with. This is Short Brothers, now Bombardier Aerospace is where I served my apprenticeship. Look them up, Google them. Short Brothers and Harland was a sister company of Harland and Wolf, which was the, one of the biggest shipbuilders in the world in Northern Ireland in Belfast, my native home. And they uh, actually built the Titanic. I don't know if that's good or not good, but they were a very leading air, uh, shipbuilding. So the city was built on engineering textile machinery and so on, heavy engineering, like Glasgow. And so Shorts was where I did my five-year apprenticeship, higher technical apprenticeship, before I actually went and got a degree. And then I worked at Honeywell as an employee. I was at uh, ABB, I was at KPMG. I say Ernst & Young here because the portion at KP, of at KPMG Canada in the United States was called Ernst & Winnie, which became Ernst & Young, and in Canada it became KPMG. It's a long story, but they split uh, back in the uh, about 
one or two. And the rest of these companies mainly are through major long-term consulting assignments. So for example, I did the Global Mill for four years, uh, Safran, which was Messi Doughty for seven years, Lockheed Martin for four years, Boeing, uh, I did I was one short, small assignment for a year with Boeing in, in um, Ottawa area, Arn Pryor, but also Boeing when they owned de Havilland, the Havilland aircraft for three years, I was helping them then. And they, they, they sold to Havilland to Bombardier, so you work for two multinational companies, you know, for first Boeing and then Bombardier. And that was in a consulting capacity, and I actually had to sell my services to, <laughs> to three or four different presidents to be retained, to finish my work. ABB, I was an employee for three years in Mississauga when I first came to Canada. It was my first management job, managing people. So look, listen, the bottom line is all the, all the stuff I teach is based on practical experience. And what I did was I started this teaching as a hobby nine, nine, ten years ago and still do it. I loved it so much that I built this whole portfolio. It was originally to take a break from industry. And uh, so I packaged it in the, and academicized all my case studies and work into a series of modules. And this is my own education and training apprenticeship plus degree plus chartered engineer, which is a master's degree in the UK plus four or five years experience of peer reviewed experience in design in design and engineering planning and so on. So you actually you don't get that qualification without uh, a rigorous process. Licensed professional engineer in Canada, certified management consultant, now fellow certified management consultant, technical college level education. Uh, what you'd call uh, similar to the community colleges in Canada or the colleges of technology and then university uh, degree and then the in institution mechanical engineers professional program for chartered engineer status which is a mixture of academic at master's level and practical experience as well where they monitor your, your, your you have to report to them you, it's self-directed this you don't become an employee IMAC -E provides the framework by which you get your chartered in mechanical engineer and then you're, you're there to, you're provided that direction and then you find your own way in industry, how you do it, but you have a set of criteria you have to meet uh, in terms of taking responsibility for design work or, or people, etc. Um, and that was the Society of Manufacturing Engineers. Okay, so back to the course again, let's look at them. There are six, six core master's courses. I also have taught these undergraduate MIE 463 Integrated Systems Design, which is really business process management. And that particularly, and I, I've, we'll, we'll be giving up the, the undergraduate teaching to focus particularly on the masters, on the students with experience. That's where really my pedigree kicks in and where I can align with you. And so this course would be embedded, this business process management course would be embedded into the operations of production and a little bit of it would be in the APS 101 too because you have to design a, the architecture of a future enterprise you're going to transform. And organizational design is essentially a mini MBA. So this would be good for those going into management consulting who don't have perhaps business management experience or business management theory. This is, this is taking, looking at the organizational design, how you design from a reporting structure, what are the external factors you need to deal with, the politics, the economy, etc. And what's the internal factors, the people, the culture, the processes the technology change, etc. So these are good foundation courses in which to take the, the master's courses. And for one semester I did teach teaching teachers how to teach. That belongs to another individual. But I did teach that and it was most enjoyable. It was fourth year PhD students who were wanting to maybe become more teachers than they were to be uh, researchers and, and maybe even go into industry. So there was a portfolio of work that the PhD students had to um, master in order to give them options from a career point of view. Look, let's get through. So APS 1012, there's four, all my courses have themes. So there are four themes here and all have team projects. So this part one puts business innovation into context. What is innovation? You've got process innovation, product innovation, business management innovation, cultural innovation, social innovation. Innovation is a word that's been used just, it's become a, a fad and a buzzword. But it applies to all elements of society. And I have a radio show called Innovation Nation. 
And what that implies is that a whole nation can be innovative depending on the government policies, depending on the culture itself and its openness to learning and its openness to change. Innovation and change management are connected. You cannot innovate if, unless you manage change. And when you manage change, you have to manage resistance. So this part, part two, uh, two talks about how you actually design an enterprise, the business processes from concept design through to shipping and building the product. So you have to have rigorous business processes in which to uh, manage the, the business and also innovate a, a rigorous process to take ideas to market, to take ideas to fruition. So I teach that. And also the cultural, the cultural dimension of designing an enterprise. Now you could be designing an enterprise from scratch or you could be redesigning it from you know, buying a company or brought in to help and turn it around. And then there's the innovation process itself, which is often the new product development process. And the, how you organize that, how you use project management tools and techniques and integrated product teams, how you do knowledge management, how you embed the new process in the culture and get the culture to adapt to it, the innovation process. So you have to, there's always a tension between changing the, the methods by which you do work, by which you innovate, and the ability of the people to absorb those. And then this is how do you sustain the enterprise. So you've turned it around, you've put new processes and you've brought new technologies and you've put the right governance and you have the right management structure. How do you sustain it? Well, there's a, I have a, syst a book on systematic problem solving, which allows you to, to study the as is processes over and over again and design the to be. So you're constantly renewing. This is all about business renewal. Part five of the teams basically you work in teams, so typically a class that says 20 to 35 students. So typically you have five, four to six teams in that, in that class and you would work on, a, on an innovation project in, in, in any area you can imagine. And I've, there's all the projects, past projects are all on my company website and my personal profile, there's a whole section there under teaching and in there you'll see all the previous projects and the executive summaries. So this was the second course, APS 1013. So this course, ideally you have this course under your belt, then you do this, but you don't have to. The truth is you don't have to. I also cross-reference them. So for those students who haven't taken this, sometimes I include videos in this course and vice versa to give you a broader insight. You don't go into that in depth. If, if, it's, a, if it's a video from this course that I've added to the other course, you don't go into it in depth as you would in this. But if you have a look at the, ter the, top, the topics here, first of all, there's the, the process innovation methodology itself. So it's, it's based on my book, The 17 Steps of Problem Solving. There's six overarching steps, but it's actually packaged. It's stuff I used in industry. How do you analyze a business, business analysis? How do you look at the issues that the business is, has to face? What are the priorities of those issues? How do you then do fishbone diagrams and get to the root causes? of the major problems and the root cause and then how do you come up with solutions to eliminate the root causes so you go down you dig down into the root cause then you get solutions for the root cause then you come back up as you knock off each root cause you're starting to get the solution the overarching solution so I teach how you do that so business analysis then I teach effective organizational teamwork team meetings managing meetings there are billions of hours wasted in very badly managed meetings so you learn about having agendas, having minutes, keeping to the minutes, the three P's, the purpose of the meeting, the process, the process or the agenda by which you conduct the meeting, and the payoff, what, what's the deliverables, what's, what's the value added. And most people will learn to ask, okay, what am I here for? What, what am I, what's the takeaway? And if you can't answer that, then the meeting is not properly structured. So the second, so the first industrial trip takes part after week three. So I, I align you with various companies. So lo local companies around the, around the greater Toronto area. And all those company names are on my website. And then in part two, you start looking at the real world of conflict resolution, because you will face it, nothing bad, nothing serious. In my nine, 10 years of teaching, there's never been any serious conflict. There's been minor things. One student isn't engaging, or there's a problem with the, the client or the industrial partner, we call them and rarely it's very minor because there's a lot of uncertainty. I don't, every student that comes to these classes new, sometimes they've taken other courses and I know them, but sometimes most of them I don't know. So I don't know the, 
they're unpredictable. I don't know how they're going to act in the industrial environment and I don't know how the employees of the industrial partner will act. They might be strange, they might emerge strange. Rarely happens, usually it's 99.99% perfect, wonderful. But there are uncertainties. Then we teach creativity and solutions development, so how to be creative. There's a science to being creative, there's a methodology for creativity. Brainstorming techniques are one method, there are others. Um, how you assess an organization's ability to change. Just because you've come up with solutions, is that organization ready to adapt them? So you learn how you actually would assess them. And then the emotional intelligence for implementation. When you deal with it, you're going to get resistance. It's in, it, resistance and change and managing change are Th constant throughout all major change initiatives or major transformational initiatives. And then in mod week 10 I talk about management consulting and when I built that module I didn't have a full course on it. Now that's a full course. There was another module there but everybody asked me, well tell us about the consulting industry because by that time you've, you're mastering some of the skill sets that one needs to be a management consultant or a change agent. And then managing the social and political power games because by that time you're, you've got enough knowledge and know-how that you realize that when you want to implement, there's politics all around you. Not that you implement, you don't implement in this course. You can't unless you get in a job, unless you, they hire you and then you present your final project. Okay, history and philosophy, just to cut to the chase there. I started off by giving you a concept of the history of technology and its implications on culture and social and society. So we start off about what drives technology, is it culture or does the technology drive culture, technological determinism? Well, it's both. And then we talk about the history of medieval technology, the print press, the clock, and so the print press, the clock and gunpowder are the three core ones, but there are many others. There's weapon systems, of course, the bow and arrow, the longbow, which was a big f feature in this 15th century when the English fought the French, the longbow was one of the competitive advantages, you know, to use a business term, that the English had over the French at that time. And that was an innovation, and it's the skill sets and competencies by which they mastered the use of the longbow to take out the, the horses and the knights of the French Battle of Agincourt. But the, there are many other uh, innovations, the road of the Romans, the stirrup of the horse, you know, for, for putting a saddle on a horse and so on. Many of these innovations, of course, give somebody a competitive advantage for a while. And gunpowder and the print press had massive, massive cultural ch transformational change on the way the planet was uh, governed. So it was the rise of Protestant Reformation after the invention of the print press, where the public began to protest against the control of the Catholic Church. And that, that, that schism change has, is still with us today with multiple other sub-religions within Protestantism and so, and so too in is the Islamic world and other uh, so the internet is the new print press it's just liberating so you have a whole alternative media now, a whole alternative news that didn't exist 10 15 years ago well existed but very few could get access everybody has access now short of censoring the internet you're, you're going to be getting all kinds of alternative points of view but from their mainstream media, which for many, for all intents and purposes, I think in the time of shooting this, is somewhat dying, if you look at the ratings of the mainstream news. So society and technology enables society to re, re, reconfigure itself in terms of its beliefs and values. And those societies themselves are, you know, all over the world are malleable, are changing. We then in part two talk about the professionalization of engineering. When did PNG become a a professional license. Why do the British not license their engineers but have chartered? They have high status titles but they don't have practice licensing where they do in the United States, Canada. Why is it engineers in Germany and France and Italy are extremely high prestige where in the Britain they're thought of as people that fix toilets? Now highly educated people in Britain know that graduate engineers and chartered engineers don't do that. But the public and the masses, that's the way they think and to the extent that the shortage of engineers, professional engineers chartered, are, is enormous. And they can't get young people attracted to this, that profession in the school. And it's all to do with a distant professional institutions, the mechanicals, the electricals, the civil engineers, which are, were elite institutions stuck in their ivory towers, stuck in big 
fancy historical buildings close to the Houses of Parliament. So this was like an inbred culture of, of elitism that did not reach out to the public and only has started to in the last 20 years and so far with very little impact or effect because young people simply don't, are not attracted to the word engineering, which is very different in Islamic countries, in Ar Ar Arabia, or the Middle East, I should say, or the Far East, China, India, where engineering is a prestigious path to follow. And so too in Hispanic countries as well, to be an engineer is, is, is uh, looked upon very highly, and, the, and to some extent in Canada and the United States, not to the same extent as perhaps Germany and France and Italy, or even Russia. So we talk about all these differences and what, what, what is the formation of engineers. It used to be apprenticeship versus degree and now we, we're getting the British per, for, per, in particular are bringing back the apprenticeship. The five, I'm talking not a two-year thing, I'm talking a five-year rigorous apprenticeship merged with bachelor's and master's degrees. So you've over maybe a period of seven to eight years and out of it you become a fully qualified engineer, chartered engineer. Um, and so the British have brought that back because the engineering is a professional practice and so to divorce it from the professional practice it doesn't make sense, which is wor what's happened in North America where degree for all intents and purposes is 95% theory and it dabbles in the practice side of it. But if it, if it was merged with practice in industry where you had a real job and you were placed in a university and it was a collaborative situation where you were doing real work for real money and getting your degree simultaneously over a period of years, which the British have brought back, then you're, you're getting a whole different type of qualified engineer. That, that's the kind of system I went through, which I didn't know at the time the advantage it would give me, but it has been a tremendous advantage. At a very young age, getting embedded with the practice of engineering as opposed to just the theory. So then we talk about engineering identity, invisible profession. Why, is, why are engineers obsessed with status? Why, why do they, not all, but why is it so many are not happy with their status? Well, they're removed from the public. Lawyers, you go to the public. You're practicing in the face of the public. Doctors as well, even pharmacists, dentists. You're talking, you're talking directly to the public. Engineers are behind the scenes. They're often in cubicles or hard hats, but they're typically behind the scenes for the end product that the company uses. Architects get all the credit for buildings because the public relates the building to the architect as opposed to the engineers who really make it safe and functional. So there's a whole lot of cultural reasons and I get you to understand that. And then we talk about the future role in the engineering society. If the engineer wants to become a called upon for policy level decisions, then the engineering education system has to change and the engineers themselves have to acquire a whole new set of skills, rhetoric, being able to speak publicly about matters, being able to stand up and say, hey, you know, the way our weapons are being used in, the, in these wars is wrong. But most engineers don't do that. Most engineers are conservative by nature and stand behind, sit behind the scenes where the public policy is being made. So that's left usually to the lawyers, the polit who most politicians are. And so engineers, again, would have to have through a, a transformative process. And so that's what this course focuses on. So the operation is much more down to earth, focuses on sustaining production systems in manufacturing or healthcare or whatever. But my focus mainly is manufacturing. That's my pedigree. And that's where this knowledge all came from. It was born out of the mass production system of Henry Ford then into the discrete manufacturing of the aerospace industry. So it's a typical course that we've taught in the United States or Britain where you first you put it in context, what's operations or manufacturing strategy, what's the role of technology in it, how do robots play a role, computer integrated manufacturing, computer aided design. And then product design focuses on the product development process, not, not just the design of the physical product but the actual management of the process. So if you're designing an aircraft, you may have two or three thousand engineers and maybe three, four programs, uh, three different aircraft lines that you're building, that you're designing or working on or sustaining. And those engineers have to follow a standard systematic process from concept, preliminary, detailed design, testing, manufacture and so on. So we talk about that and then we talk about how, you, how plants are laid out, you know, from the continuous flow plant to the job shop from the job shop to the current manuf uh, flexible manufacturing cells and, and agile factories. And then locations, where do you locate your factory? Where, what, 
if you're if you're going to manufacture goods that are going to be sold mainly in the Far East, you probably should build a factory there. If they're going to be goods sold in, in Canada or the United States, you're likely want to produce a factory unless you offshore because of cheaper labor. But there's a tendency now to bring it back. So where do you locate? So you locate it based on transportation, the center of gravity. Where are, where are your main customers? So if you've customers, maybe in, in the Midwest, Chicago, you might want to locate your factory equidistant from each of them. And also you want to consider where your suppliers are located. So you have to balance all these uh, decisions so that you get the best location with the least cost for transportation and logistics and the most best support. And there are lots of mathematical and uh, statistical methods in which you can employ to do that. And there are specialists that specialize in that, that uh, you know, service. Where should you locate? How should you lay your plant out? And it's, it's built usually around your product configuration. And then designing the actual work system. So you know you've got people on the shop floor and you've got roles and responsibilities. You have to design job design. You've got to have a precise set of procedures for an individual to do his work and to do it efficiently. So you've got, you've got to consider things like ergonomics. So the man and machine, human and machine. The relationship of, of space, of reaching. You don't want to do too much reaching. You get a pain in your back. It's just for, for job design. And even in the drawing office, the, the, the thinking office, you, you have boundaries by which you take this input and you add value and then you deliver your input to someone else. You specialize in stress analysis. So you say, yes, the wing is fit for purpose. So you pass that on and they say, right, let us, he says that the wing is fit for purpose and it's not going to fall off the plane. The fasteners, the, the, the fastening methods to the fuselage are good. Well, that's good. Then we, so then the, the airframe designers say, right, let's fix it. That's the design. So you've got to design the work system, which designs the physical products or the, delivers the services. So if you have a pizza place, you want to run a pizza uh, shop, you need to have the capacity. What, how much capacity do we need? What, what, what's the expectation of how many customers are going to come in here on a Friday and Saturday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday? What's the distribution typically? And then inventory, how much pizza dough do we, cut, we want to store? If we're, how much uh, pepperoni should we keep? How much tomato should we keep? If you keep too much, you'll spoil and you'll lose money. If you keep too little, you'll be out and you'll, and you'll anger the customers. What do you keep? Same as jet engines, of an aircraft. Should you carry 20 of them on, in stock or zero? Should you just do it just in time? But what if it's just in time and they're late for the production system? Then lean, how do you take waste out of the, out of the operations? Project management is, is, a, is a full course here, but it's also a module here because in operations, we use project management to manage the decisions that are made all the way from the concept design through to shipping. So we use project management techniques specifically in project-driven engineering environments. And then maintenance and reliability, people often overlook this. You've got all these machine tools, hundreds of millions of dollars in the large factories. You better make sure you maintain them like you maintain your car. Don't you take your car every 5,000 kilometers for an oil change? Don't you get your mechanic to also give it a tune-up once a year? Make sure that the, 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 perf the different components of it are performing, that your tires are not too bald, etc. Preventive maintenance and reliability, uh, quality and reliability. All, 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 they, they've all, I've put them all near the end simply because they are very, very important subject matters. But they're something that are, there are support systems to the core operational processes. So aerospace basically takes all those different courses and applies them in the aerospace industry and right now I've partnered with Bombardier. I don't know how long that will last, that could change. But it is for aerospace, it is at Utias and we talk about the aerospace, we orient what is the aerospace industry. I teach you in this uh, videos that say well what's a wing, what's the fuselage, what's the rear fuselage, what's the empennage, what's a cowling, so you, you understand the language. Even some academically aerospace engineers who specialize maybe in satellite or, or, or aerodynamic flow, boundary flow, etc., some of them may not know all the components of an aircraft, and if they talk to the people that actually build these things, may not know the terminology. So students are going to work with the operational people, and they need to understand the principles by which an aircraft flies. What's the principles of flight, of lift and drag? and the propulsion system to lift it and to move to both vertical and horizontal and to land and so on. So those principles are discussed. 
some of the engineers maybe in the class are academically understand that stuff inside out but there's the, there's that then having a conversation with the people that build it if you look at an aircraft company probably 15 percent 10 to 50 maybe less of them are the engineers that actually design the product the, the concept not not the detailed design there's a lot more than that but the bulk, bulk of money that's spent is spent on the building at the raw materials the, 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 the fabrication processes to make the components, the assembly processes, the major assembly, the final assembly, the flight test, the proving and the production, then serial production, big factories, big bays. That's where all the money, so if you're an aerospace engineer and you don't know about all that, you're at a big disadvantage. You're essentially going to be stuck in a cubicle. You certainly are not going to go into the higher levels of management unless you understand how an, an aerospace company operates. And that's what this course is about. And then we talk about manufacturing production. And, and then the fourth part, I talk about the regulation and the culture of aerospace. It's unique. It's highly, heavily regulated by the various transportation authorities. That's not my module 10. That, that is not my pedigree. I know what they do. But I usually bring in a specialist to talk about that specific area because airworthiness is a massive field, uh, which, which are the, the body that says this aircraft is fit for purpose. All right, APS 1049 is it my sort of Cap, capstone project, uh, course for those that want to go into a consulting career. And when you go into a consulting career, you can go back into industry. You can leave industry, go into it, or you can go back up to a certain point, depending on your age. So we put consulting in context. What are the consulting kinds of roles? There's content consulting, where you're selling technical knowledge or knowledge of a business. And there's process where you're a facilitator. Typically, you want to have both skill sets. You want to be a pedigree on, in some technical area like product development or manufacturing systems or marketing or finance or sales or human resources. Or you could be an industry. You could be a, a, a consultant that specializes in banking, the trends in banking, the trends in healthcare. You could be a medical doctor who then wants to transform the way the healthcare system works or the hospitals within the healthcare. So you would have to have the technical knowledge where you can actually coach them and train them on the new thinking, the new methods. But then you have to also have the process knowledge by which you allow them to learn and to absorb it and you facilitate them through the change. So there are various stages to consulting, of course. There's the entry. You, you, if you can't enter a client and actually close a deal and get a job, you're, you're going to go bankrupt. So you have to find the opportunities, that's number one through, through uh, networking, through marketing, uh, through rain makers, people that make the rain, that create the business, that get the opportunities. Then you go and you meet those clients and then you sell them a value that they say, right, give me a proposal. You give them the proposal, hopefully you get it. And um, once you get it, then you go in and you do your first phase or second phase is diagnostics. What are the issues they face? Let's drill down. And you come up with recommendations of the way forward. That's when you engage them. They have to be part of the solution where you start implementing. And then there's termination. You should not linger too long. You may have a long-term relationship with a client. I've had some up to 15 years. But it was in and out, in and out. Sometimes it was there for maybe two years uh, all the time. You know, well, three, maybe three days a week. But eventually, that, if, to maintain your independence, to maintain the arm's length relationship, you ought to terminate. You ought to set an expectation you're not an employee. You never should. If you're an employee, you're not a consultant. You could be an internal consultant employee, and I talk about that. But it has its advantages and it has its disadvantages, because you're not arm's length. You're part of the political system. It's a cheap way for companies to, to, to bring in talent and make them consultants. But you're still not getting the arm's length relationship, because there's a certain political architecture that you have to adhere to when you're an internal consultant. So that's something I never wanted, never would do, because I believed in the the arm's length and the true independence. I did not want to be influenced by any power structures. That's my choice. But there are many people who have done well as internal consultants. Some then become staff members and become CEOs. So you can, there's consulting in various areas. Functions, marketing, manufacturing, manufacturing systems, manufacturing in the food industry, manufacturing in the aerospace industry, manufacturing in the automotive industry, manufacturing in the machine tools or plastics pharmaceuticals, or you can be 
a manufacturing industry expert that understands a piece of all those functions. So you could lead others. You could be an account manager for a big consulting firm specializing in just er the defense industry. So you may have Lockheed Martin and Boeing as your clients and you put the teams in there. So there are many ways to cut up the different roles of consulting. Or you may be obsessed with product development and become a world round ex expert at consumer goods, fast moving consumer goods. You could be a product development expert in that field, portfolio management, ideation, getting new products to market fast, which is something different in the aerospace. You know, these are long life cycle items. It takes 20, 30 years before a technology gets completely embedded, like composite materials, when you're replacing aluminum to composites. You have to prove it. You have to prove it on second piece, start with the leading edge, then the trailing. Uh, the, the leading edge and then the other uh, aerodynamic surfaces that are not primary, they're not primary physical structures. So you start off in pieces, then you do a whole wing, and then from the wing you migrate to the fuselage once you prove it till you have an all composite aircraft. But that can take 20, 30 years. Very different than mass consumer goods. So you have to choose your markets based on your interests. Aerospace could be slow for some people. Others are interested in the fashion industry, the changes, constant change. Aerospace doesn't have constant change. They have, they have ideas that are in the 1970s that are only becoming into fruition now, forward swept wings and so on. So the skills of success, there's legal and ethical, there's lots of bad press about consulting, the witch doctors, the devils, McKinsey has been called, there's a book, is McKinsey evil? Well, of course a lot of this stuff is hype. But there's some truth to it as well. There is corruption. Enron, WorldCom, Anderson Consulting, it had to change its name to Accenture. There's all kinds of shenanigans. That's not the profession though. There is professional institutes. Most of those practitioners wouldn't engage in this stuff. But consulting, a lot of people can call themselves that. But like engineers in Britain, everybody calls themselves an engineer. 90% are not qualified, but they call themselves engineers, electricians or electrical engineers, plumbers or plumbing, heating engineers, mechanics for automotive mechanics or automobile engineers. That's the, just, that's the culture. We're here, consultants, travel consultants. Rogers, uh, our consultants will be on the line soon. So the word itself, so that this term certified management consultant was created in order to professionalize the, 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 prof the, the industry, etc. And it's been around since the 1950s and it's not a global a global qualification, the, Insti the International Institute for Certified Management Consultants or some such name. And then I talk about managing your career. I actually make you do a blueprint, a business plan. You get a business plan to run your own consulting business or a blueprint for a career. Perhaps if you want to join one of the big four counting consulting firms or you want to join the big strategy firms of McKinsey, Bain, Boston Consulting and so on. And, and you're, you get a project, oh, this, this consulting works with the external uh, companies. So, for example, Pricewaterhouse, Coopers, or PwC, or Deloitte, or KPMG. And perhaps in the future, I will approach McKinsey and, and Bain, etc. There are opportunities for engineers and, and applied scientists, medical doctors, life scientists. These are all emerging, health is an emerging field, big time for consulting. So is life sciences. These other courses, I won't go into them too much because uh, I don't teach them. I won't be teaching them in the future, though I will embed the knowledge into, the, into my master's courses. But basically, how do you design an organizational? It's really 101. We'll call it in a mini MBA, but the purpose of an organization, how you design it, and so on. And the integrated systems is business process management. So you can look that up in any, on Google, at, and it, I go into that in great depth. Uh, and you get to use some of this stuff in the master's courses. My whole idea here, without getting into this in too much depth, is to take you to higher level thinking, creative thinking, is to be able to have a conversation with the chief executive officer or the chief operating officer, or the chief vice president or director of engineering or the chief engineer, is to be able to have conversa management conversations with them about their issues, the issues they're facing. That's the whole purpose of this. Plus it, it also looks at you as an engineer as well to try to lift you to a higher level of thinking. That's what it's about. It's not remembering methods and tools and techniques or formulas or equations. That's boring stuff. It's about having you think on your own two feet 
and when you're meeting people, you're able to relate to them at the level by which they are thinking. And there's, this is again a higher order of thinking. I talk about this in each class, so I won't go into it now. But I'm trying to get you at the strategic policy level, the thinking level, how, how, how organizations are shaped and even how society is shaped. How you should need to think long term. What's going to happen 5, 10, 15 years out? The higher up the hierarchy you go, the more complexity you manage. That's why these guys at the very top, level six and seven directors and managers and CEOs who are managing thousands of people are making so much money because they are making decisions that have long reach and impact. Sad thing is in many of the banking industry and so on, people up there are going away with millions of dollars but are wrecking the industry. Now that is one of the immoral things that's happening and society ought to correct that. It's not at the moment, at least at the time of the, making this video. So there's so much immorality in terms of our leadership and even in the political system, all the shenanigans that we keep hearing coming out all the time. These are people working at these levels, but they're also lining their pockets. That's immoral and it's not good. Don't follow that path. And there's more details here. Management versus leadership. I'm trying to create leaders, not managers, not people sitting in cubicles, but people leading, people with idea, ideas, visionaries, people that are creating future state visions. Okay. I'm going to end it there. Uh, welcome you to, to these courses. I really look forward to uh, engaging with you in the courses. Thank you.